There are problems, challenges, situations and failure. But to get upset or not is your choice. Welcome to the show, Shoal to Shoal Talk Show. Today we have brother Vico with us from Denmark. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Brother, tell us something about your country. Well, Denmark is uh, situated in the north of Europe, part of Scandinavia, just on the top of Germany. A uh, small country, only five million people total. And um, I think in India we are mostly known for our diary uh, products and the development of uh, this whole sector, cow breeding and milk. I think uh, all Indians learn in school about Denmark and and milk somehow. That's my experience. Um, so, um, uh, but we have many other specialities. Um, so it's a fairly uh, rich country with a very high level of social welfare, also very high taxes, of course. And um, uh, we have uh, the Brahma Kumari Center there since 1984, so it's 30 years now. And um, we have two centers, the main center where I came into this knowledge, and then the, another center in the west of the country where I am uh, located. Tell us something about the culture of your country. The culture, it's a, uh, it's a Christian culture, uh, you can say, but um, people are mostly not very religious. So, um, it's uh, because it's, uh, you know, people are, w are very uh, well off. So, usually uh, then people will not tend to bother much about spirituality and uh, religion. And So, I think it's um, fair to say that, uh, yeah, formally we are Christian, but uh, in, uh, in effect, we are actually uh, not very religious in Denmark. It's you know, it cannot be compared to India at all, or, or many other European countries. So it's a very um, sort of very grounded, very um, uh, worldly culture in many ways, um, which applies, I think, to uh, all the Scandinavian countries. But maybe we are less religious actually than in Norway and Sweden. So. Um, and the, the three, uh, those three countries, Norway, Sweden and Denmark, are very similar in culture. Uh, we, we actually understand each other's language um, because they are quite close. So, um, and I think um, you often hear that Denmark is like the, um, the um, what do they call it, the Latin people of Scandinavia because we are the most southern country and we are sort of less formal. Danes are known in the world to be very little formal. You know, they will speak out very directly what they have in mind and, and they will not, you know, be convoluted or hide their messages. They, they are very straightforward. Were you very religious minded from your childhood days? No, I wasn't. I mean, I, I had, um, when I turned about 12 or 13, I had a kind of epiphany, you know, a kind of, um, realization that um, you can say that my um, my life was not so moral you know as, as it should be and I am um, there were a lot of things I wanted to change in my character my behavior so then I I got in contact with some re some Christian circles and I uh, went there for some you know meetings and I had an interest and I also read the Bible and I, I guess I had a religious few years of you know religious um, Assurance, but then it more or less faded out. So I, I was not brought up in a religious family at all. My father was an atheist. My mom, again, she was also brought up in an atheist family. So so it was not in the family. So um, but then I came to this knowledge at the age of 21. So it was fairly early in my youth, and um, that was like a complete. Um, what should I say? It happened like within the course of a few months, and it was uh, completely, in a way, unexpected and very sudden. And and that, of course, changed my life totally after that. Tell us something about your value system and from where you learned it. My value system I learned from uh, from the Brahma Kumaris. I had no value system before, really. I don't think, uh, not consciously. I mean, there would be maybe some intuitive. Um, feeling of what is right and wrong, but you know, I would very often do that which was wrong, actually, so <laughs> it was not an intuition or a conscience that guided me very much. 
uh, only after I came to to uh, Brahma Kumaris and I had um, first and uh, above all I had the access to the divine power of the Supreme. That is when uh, you know I could actually bring my uh, first of all I could sort of develop a value system, um, and I could uh, I could also uh, adhere to it. I could live by my values because I think the. Um, uh, the big problem in the world today is not so much that uh, people have forgotten values. Also, they have to some some extent, but the the major problem is that we don't have the power to live by our values. We don't have the it create it requires spiritual power to live by our values, and um, this is what is really missing. So you can have very fine values on paper, you know, and and uh, in theory, but if you cannot. Uh, actually, if you don't have the spiritual power of peace, of love, of um, you know all the virtues that come from that, you cannot live by those values in a natural way. Uh, it becomes a bit superficial, artificial. What were your belief systems before this knowledge? Yeah. Um, I always, I think, I guess, I always, um, since that age of twelve, I told you before, I, I strongly believed that there was a God, and I, I would pray to God, and I would. Um, um, but you know what God was, the properties of God, the, the qualifications of God, I had no idea. You know, it was just like some kind of blind faith. That there was some, some being beyond that would listen to my prayers and uh, it's also a kind of yoga. It's a, you know, a communication, but without knowledge at all, without any clear understanding. Tell us about your academic life. Actually, I didn't start out uh, an academic life uh, after school. I went into a baker's apprenticeship, so I am actually a trained baker by profession, profession originally. And then after that, after working a few years as a baker, I uh, took a um, short computer science education. But then straight after that, I went to university and I uh, did um, uh, my post-graduation in physics and mathematics. So it, it has been a very, very sort of wide span of um, studies and um, um, I think I can say I'm the only, uh, probably the only physicist in Denmark who is also a baker. It's a very unusual combination, <laughs> maybe the only one in the whole world. <laughs> but um, so that's, so after uh, gra graduation I actually went straight uh, back to computer science because that's where all the jobs were. So I'm still working in that field, in, in the field of uh, telecom engineering. So. Okay. Are you single or married? I am single. As I told you, I started uh, at the age of 21, so I hadn't uh, any family at that point. So I remain single and uh, enjoy that life. Bachelor life is, uh, you know, you, it keeps you fresh mm -hmm. and young. Did you get addicted to anything? Before this knowledge? Yeah. Yeah, well, lots of addictions. Lots of addictions, but not severe. Addicted, yes, I was smoking, I was uh, also smoking with a little hashish and, uh, um, but not, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really uh, an addict as such, but you know, but just a imp general impure lifestyle, like any other youngster in, in Denmark, you know. We have um, a remarkable, I think almost, a, maybe not the world record, but we have a remarkable culture, you were asking about culture. Uh, a remarkable culture for drinking, beer drinking. So, people will walk around in the streets, sit in the streets, and drink beer. You know, not until they get completely drunk, but just as a kind of leisure, as a social thing. So, um, we also have some very large breweries in Denmark, which are famous, Carlsberg, and uh, these. So, um, <clears throat> so that's very much part of Danish culture. Every time people get together, there's alcohol on the table. So that was also, you can say, an area where I completely broke away from my old lifestyle and old culture. Tell us something about your lifestyle. My present lifestyle? No, no your past. I was, um, I, I think you can say, I mean, I, I was from the age of 16 very much into music. I played the saxophone um, very intensively for about um, maybe six years. After I came to this knowledge, after a few years, I lost interest and I, I just um, sold my horn. But um, actually, just recently, a few years ago, I acquired 
uh, saxophone again and I've taken up the, the playing. But, um, but I was, uh, my whole life was, uh, as a youngster, was really centered around uh, the jazz uh, community in Copenhagen and I was playing jazz. And Tell us something about your food style. At that time? Yeah. It was um, you know, meat, uh, alcohol, um, I would eat anything, everything, you know, it's, there was no... Uh, again, we don't have that culture in Denmark for pure and impure foods, you know, everything is eaten, basically. Were you in search of God? Before the age of 12, no, but after, probably between, from the age of 12, yeah, there was a, a deep yearning, definitely, and it would sometimes come out very strongly. Not a not a regular search in the sense that I would go to church every week or every day or nothing like that. It was more like a self-study or self-practice. Um, Were you a god fear kind of person? No, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say. It's, it was more... I don't know. The, the, the notion of God was very vague. I think there was just this sense that there was a being out there that I couldn't reach uh, and that I um, was, uh, you know, really longing for, yearning for. Yeah. Tell us about your hobbies. Well, my main hobby, uh, as I said, was uh, music, jazz music. Um, I also, I'm also very fond of uh, car maintenance. I, I do all the maintenance on my car. Uh, that is something I, I enjoy a lot. Um, I have a sort of quite, uh, I would say, technical approach to life uh, in, the, in the sense, or oh, that's that's a part of my my interests that uh, I, I love to. Um, take things apart and see how they work and uh, repair them and uh, you know make something that is uh, spoiled and make it you know valuable again and so um, so uh, yeah you can say that's a hobby I have a very very broad uh, range of interests uh, really I cannot say there's, there's one particular hobby but music is definitely and meditation it has become also a hobby for me was celibacy forced on you no, no, no. Uh, nothing is forced on us. But, but you know, once uh, I got this um, profound experience of pure divine love, it's like uh, it, it made it so clear that uh, um, yeah, sex is, is something very gross and it's something, you know, that is not really um, compatible with meditation. You know, it's, it's what I have understood after many years, is you know, love is is really a very very gentle, extremely gentle and, and very respectful um, feeling, and uh, and lust goes almost in the other direction. You know, it's you know we call it violence, and on some level it is violence, um, but it's something that I think we can only fully understand and appreciate once we have had that experience of divine love. So it it was actually very natural for me once I heard that. Uh, this is not advised anymore. It was not a problem for me. I, I mean, I, I accepted it wholeheartedly. That was, yeah, fine. How did you came in contact with the Brahma Kumaris for the first time? Things just suddenly changed overnight. And I, I knew then that I would have to pursue this somehow, because otherwise I would be wasting my life. This was really something I had to go deeper into. So then where to start? I went to libraries and I borrowed books on Raja Yoga, the Patanjali's Raja Yoga, classical Raja Yoga with uh, Hatha Yoga, Asanas, all of that. And then I started uh, at home just practicing this every morning and also meditation. And very, very soon I got tremendous experiences. I mean, I, I hadn't come to the Brahma Kumaris yet. I was still too um, to find it, but but I was already having very very profound experiences, and uh, so I knew that here was really something that was working uh, remarkably easily. So then I happened to live quite near to the Brahma Kumari Center. It was a shop um, flat, and it, in the window there was a poster of Didi Sudesh because she had just been visiting the center a few weeks before, and there was a sign, of course, free courses. So, being very innocent, I thought, well, she probably lives inside and she's running this center, let me have a free course here. And um, I rang the bell and then, of course, there was no Sudesh, it was um, two Swedish sisters who had started that center and they were 
inside. So, of course, because you took it Monday, Tuesday, etc., and Sunday you finished, and then the following Monday I came to the morning class. So it, it was like it continued. Yeah, I just continued right from the last lesson to to the morning class, and it was there was never any doubt or question whether I should pursue this or you know it was very very natural like you are born and then you come to life and you just uh, take it for granted you know it's that's that's my new life right? so only later realizations you know of my past and future came you know but but at the from the very beginning there was a, a kind of intuitive um, acceptance you know it just felt completely right. And this this is an experience many have had, you know, coming to to Baba. Did you think <laughs> so that it was a blind faith? No, not at all. Uh, I mean, again, there was no doubt in my mind, so that question didn't even come, it didn't even arise in my mind. Uh, it was like, just like I would more describe it like um, I was in a, in a kind of uh, in love, you know, with with God, with. You know, you don't you don't only recognize God; you also recognize your divine family, and um, and you recognize yourself. And you know, everything just completely made made sense to me. And uh, so um, there was no second thought. I didn't rationalize. I just um, went right into it. You know, embraced it. How difficult was it for you to leave your food habits? Not at all. I I have never um, had any. Um, I've never missed, you know, meat or whatever. I I stopped eating. It. After a while, you start to, as a vegetarian, you start to develop a strong distaste for meat. Actually, it becomes very, very um, impure. You know, it's amazing how once you don't have the knowledge and you eat meat, you don't think of it. But once you you suddenly realize, your eyes open and you you just look at it. It it, it feels completely impure. You know. So I never, I never miss that. One of my interests, I, I can say, is cooking. So, uh, so I took a lot of, um, in, you know, finding good vegetarian recipes and experiment. How did your family reacted when you thought that you will stay single? Ah, uh, okay. This is not so much of an issue in the West um, because we don't have that strong family bondages. Uh, my parents got uh, divorced when I was a child. So many, many couples divorce in Denmark and in, in the West. So it's um, it's very fragmented families. And so uh, maybe there would be some kind of uh, resentment or some kind of regret. Um, I don't know. We never talked about it, you know. Uh, but but you know, it's not l like it was a big scandal or it was completely. Um, um, both my mom and my dad have. Um, I mean, I have siblings, so they have children, so they have sort of fulfilled that desire for grandchildren uh, in the family. So it's not that you know it was just as if you only if you have only one child and that child don't, doesn't want to marry, you know, it breaks the lineage. Um, but uh, there were other siblings that could lift that resp responsibility, so no problem. Did you ever felt very lonely? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say loneliness was um, was um, a predominant feeling in my uh, youth. I felt, um, I, I always felt um, in a way um, out of uh, touch with this time, you know, I, I felt that a lot of the, I had a very clear feeling as a child that this world was too big. <laughs> Basically, there was I would I would like to sort of comprehend and embrace the whole world, you know, as if it was a very small world. But the world was so big. Just just thinking of how many human beings there were. So, I I I um, I had a strange uh, feeling of um, uh, alienation in this world, and um, and also loneliness. I guess yeah. But later I understood that you know the whole feeling of loneliness loneliness is really that you're not able to um, to connect you know because um, it all has to do with love and belonging you know? uh, once you are in an environment where you feel you belong with people you feel you belong to 
then there will be a natural sense of love and then you will not feel lonely. But um, I didn't have that um, privilege, I didn't have that, even though I mean, there was love, there was affection, there was you know, a good family background, but um, you know, the, the, the yearning of the soul is so much deeper, it goes uh, beyond this life. And it was really a love for divine, a longing for divine love from God. Uh, that's what it all came from. Did you ever thought of committing suicide? No, never. No, I'm not that type. I, I am a, I'm a very, very resilient uh, type in the sense that I would go through anything. I, w I never give up. You know, unless I realize that it's not worth pursuing or there's, sand, it doesn't make sense anymore. Or, but you know, hardships and obstacles uh, doesn't. They don't put me off, you know. I I just um, I went through tough years in my youth, um, in certain relationships. But uh, you know, I I didn't um, I, I didn't give up. I didn't uh, flee. You know, I, I I had a kind of sense of feeling that um, you really have to go through it. There's a kind of learning process, or also a, a certain I guess a certain honor is involved. You know, you don't. Once you give up on something, you are defeated. It's like you lose your honor. So uh, I guess I had a, quite a pride, you know, that, uh, that I tried to... How often do you come to India? I come to uh, India every year, and I have to come to India every year, because uh, as I mentioned before, um, recognition of God, recognition of your divine family, recognition of yourself, This is uh, these are three basic recognitions that we all get when we come to Baba. But for double foreigners, there's a fourth recognition, which is very uh, special and very unique and very, for me, very precious. Uh, and that is the recognition of India, of Bharat. Because I really felt when I came to India that this was a country I had had so many good lives in and I had, I had a very strong connection with India from the beginning and I still have and um, there are a few things that can make me emotional not many but one of them is in India you know um, and um, it's like it, it's so deeply rooted within my my sanskaras my subconsciousness so so there has uh, been a very very important sustenance in my life coming to India once a year do you really think so that India is your homeland Oh, very much so. I mean, I, I feel much, much deeper connected with India than with Denmark. Denmark is, I have no um, resonance, no sort of deep um, feelings for Denmark, but I have very deep feelings for India. And that just shows that, you know, whatever are your strongest uh, feelings, they come from a completely different uh, realm. You know, it's it's very, very deeply ingrained within you. It's not something that comes from just this one birth. It's like an eternal eternal um, belonging. Yeah? Since how many years you are in this spiritual knowledge? I am uh, now 29 years. Um, I came in 85. So the center opened in 84. So I was one of the first students. And um, yeah. How was the journey? Incredible. It's. Um, I think you can only really uh, understand this journey in hindsight because every moment there are new, completely surprising turns in your spiritual life. You know, things emerge uh, and from within, and things happen around you that just um, um, they just come like a th thunderbolt, you know, from a clear sky. It's, uh, you, you had never expected it. And it's, it's magic. This life is magic. To me, at least, it, it has been magic. Magic things happen, you know. Sometimes a bit frightening, sometimes uh, um, a bit overwhelming, but, uh, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't uh, be without them. You know, I, these are still very, very precious experiences, spiritual experiences. Can money be replaced by spirituality? Money be replaced by spirituality? Um, maybe you should qualify the question. What, what do you mean? Because money is God, so can we replace it by spirituality? 
Uh, money is God. You mean this is a, a common notion in the world? Yes. Yes. I mean, p people don't know what God is at all. So they they. Um, <clears throat> Um, and when you don't have God in your life, then you will, uh, there will be some kind of void, some emptiness, necessarily. And you will then try to fill in that void with something external, from relationships, from uh, your achievements, you know, whatever you do in life. And um, I, <coughs> I think it, it can never really bring uh, complete fulfillment. You know, God is the only one that can really fill your heart. And and then um, money is money. I mean, uh, money is is just a, a means of uh, exchanging values, huh? but I mean material values. But you cannot buy love, peace, or any other um, spiritual qualities with money. We will continue this journey to the next episode. Till then, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>